first of all, uh, remote sensing, basically, we are, talk about, we are talking about the art of uh, being able to get information about something without being in touch with it. And uh, there are several forms of remote sensing that are being used, some of them being the variation in force distribution. An example being a uh, force of gravity, which is being measured using a gravity meter. And then we have the electromagnetic energy distribution, which is the most common form of uh, energy that is being used in remote sensing. And my presentation will be focused around the electromagnetic uh, form of uh, remote sensing. The electromagnetic energy composes of the radio waves, which are the longest waves. We have the infrared, we have the visible spectrum, we have the ultraviolet, we have the X-rays and the gamma. And uh, most of the electromagnetic energy that we use is from the sun as the sun propagates its energy to the surface of the earth, it's being reacted to by different phenomena, some of them being the atmosphere. Some of the energy is being scattered in the atmosphere. The one which manages to penetrate until it reaches the surface of the earth is also meeting some of the objects on the earth, some of them being trees, water, and many other objects which absorb some of the energy and reflect some back into the atmosphere. And here I was trying to show how uh, different phenomena react to uh, electromagnetic energy from the sun. Uh, in this curves, I was showing uh, how soil reacts to the visible energy. There is high reflectance so it, it, it highly reflects the visible energy all the way up to the short wave infrared energy. Then uh, when you look at the green vegetation, the green vegetation, it uh, absorbs some of energy within the blue and red uh, zones and then it reflects highly in the green region. That's why we see green vegetation. And also reflects a lot of energy in the near infrared before it absorbs some in the short infrared region. And then water, clear water. It reflects highly within the visible region and then it absorbs almost everything thereafter the visible region being in the near infrared and the short wave infrared and the water that is not clear the contaminated water the water with phyto plant planton you see it uh, doesn't reflect a lot of energy as clear water so there are variations in how they react and this brings my discussion also to the fact that uh, different objects react to different energy depending on their composition or their makeup. And I'll show you in a bit uh, variations in plant uh, reflectance of energy or reaction to energy. As I have already alluded, the green vegetation and the visible bands, it re re reflects highly in the green and then it has high absorbance because of the uh, chlorophyll in the red region. But dry plants or plant with stress, it reflects highly in this area, in the red region. And most uh, studies that uses re uh, remote sensing to study plants, they use these regions. It's called the red, uh, red edge region. That is between the red bands and the infrared. And like I said, uh, we have different uh, types of sensors, being the passive sensors, 
which uses the passive sensing method. And these ones, they use the energy that is being uh, emitted by a different source for study uh, the behavior of objects or various objects to that energy. Then we have the active sensors. The active sensors, they produce their own energy. And they also detect how different phenomena on Earth reacted to the energy they are producing. And uh, with the passive sensors, uh, normally when we talk about this one, we talk about the sensors that react to energy between the visible bands and uh, the and, and the, the near infrared, but also we have uh, those that react to the emission of energy on Earth. And uh, those are, that re reacts to the heat, the heat that is being uh, released from the, that is being released by different objects on Earth. For example, as the sun is heating or different uh, objects are releasing their own energy like human body. And uh, this uh, reaction by different objects to the electromagnetic energy is being recorded. Traditionally, it was being recorded in fo using photographs, which uh, were detecting these reactions and recording them on film. Now we have the digital image recording which record the electronic signals that corresponds to various uh, uh, energy, that re re uh, corresponds to energy variations in the scene or yeah, in the scene. And these uh, sensors are carried by uh, different platforms. As I will elaborate going on, we have the sensors that are called the ground Based, that are held by ground-based platforms. These are your cameras that you'll be holding with your hands or those that are held uh, on raised platforms. Like the example I'm showing here is a camera being mounted on top of a vehicle for Google Street Mapping. And then we have what are called the airborne platforms. The airborne platforms, we have the aeroplanes, we have the drones, and we have the hot air balloons. And then there are the space sensors or the space platforms. The space platforms are those that are like satellites which are orbiting in, in space. And uh, remote sensing also is affected by what we call the resolutions. There are five most common resolutions, one being spatial resolution. And when you talk about the spatial resolution, basically you talk about how big or small a sensor can see, or the object that can be detected by the sensor. We have the temporal resolution. Temporal resolution, we talk about the time the a sensor takes to image a certain portion. That is the revisit time. If it, for example, if it passes Botswana today at 10, and then it comes tomorrow at 10, we say the temporal resolution is one day. So the time it takes between the two intervals to image an area. Then we have the spectral resolution. Spectral resolution, in simple terms, we talk about the amount of energy or the variation of energy bands that can be picked by that sensor. Then we have the radiometric resolution. The radiometric resolution, we talk about the smallest variations that a sensor can pick in terms of the data values. And I will explain this later. And then we have the view angle. The angle at which our sensor is when it captures the, the, the images. Now, going back to spatial resolution, uh, as I said, the spatial resolution for a human being, because our eyes are also doing remote sensing, we study 
objects mostly without being in contact with them. So basically our eyes are also sensors. And the smallest thing that we can see on average is uh, 50 micrometers thick. And now when you talk about this, uh, you will find that the image is, is presented in pixels or they're called picture elements, the small boxes. If you zoom into images in your cameras, you will see the small X, uh, boxes. Those are called the pixels or picture elements. And here, as I was saying, we have the high or high to very high resolution sensors. Those are that can pick the objects that are as small as 30 centimeters and up to five meters, the range of the smallest objects that can be picked ranges between 30 centimeters and five meters. And then we have the medium resolution sensors. The medium resolution sensors are the sensors that can pick the objects. The smallest, smallest object it can pick should be 10 meters or more. And in most cases, the, the resolutions for these ones are between 30 and between 10 and 30 centimeters. And the lower resolution sensors are those that can pick objects which are 60 meters or big. And then, like I said, there is what is called spectral resolution. For a human eye, will say the spectral resolution for a human eye is the visible, uh, the, uh, is in the visible region, what a human eye can see. But with our sensors for remote sensing, you find that different sensors have different uh, spectral resolutions. There are sensors that can pick only objects or light or energy reflectance within the visible and near infrared region. And I gave an example of Worldview 2 here. And then we have those sensors like Landsat 8 which picks the variations or the reflectances within the visible range, the near infrared, and even in the shortwave infrared regions. And here I was trying to show the various uh, resolutions for human beings, for bee, and for butterfly. And these uh, resolutions, I show them in simulation that and a rose or a flower that you see in red, for a, for a bee, it appears in different color. And for a butterfly, it even appears in much more different color because you have different uh, spectral resolutions or you see different light reflectances. I think I talked about the temporal resolution is the revisit period. And for different satellites, you find that, uh, or different sensors, you find that the revisit period differs. In most cases, you find that sensors with lower resolution takes a lot of time to pass or before it can pass over the same place again. And those with very high resolution take less days so that uh, before passing over the same area again. And why is this uh, temporal resolution important? Temporal resolution is important in remote sensing because we use it for change analysis or change detection. Since this sensor passed this area, what has changed or what has happened? And uh, like I said, with a uh, radiometric resolution, it is important because it helps to pick slight variations. And by doing so, it increases your ability to see even small changes in your study area or in what you are studying. And uh, the range for radiometric uh, resolution is expressed in powers of two. We have one bit which contains two values. It's either, it's in binary, it's either zero or one. And then we have eight bit resolution. The images with eight bit resolutions contain about 256 values, which ranges from zero to 255. 
So it means that uh, it can give smaller details of changes within the pixels. Remember I said uh, the data is recorded in picture elements. Those are the spatial resolutions in most cases. And then we have the 16-bit resolution, which is of much higher resolution because it can record up to 65,335 changes or variations. And all these are recorded as values within the pixels and they're called the digital numbers or brightness values. And uh, because I've been talking about remote sensing as detecting variations in those uh, spectral resolutions or in light reflectances, how, do we, how is it benefiting us in archaeology? We find that in archaeology, our sites uh, have various uh, physical composition, chemical and physical compositions because of the human activities that occur within them. In some areas, we find that there was a, a wall that has been constructed. And you know where a wall has been constructed and is being covered by soil or is not covered, there will be less moisture within the wall. And in some cases, we find that people have dug a ditch. And you know where a ditch is being dug. There's a bit of accumulation of organic deposits and fine seals or fine soils. Most of these deposits, we find that they are very rich in nutrition. And if the rain comes, we find that the ditch, because of those loose particles and rich organic content, it retains much higher moisture and it has, and also because it already has high nutrition value from the organic deposits. The vegetation that grows on the dish, it grows much healthier than the vegetation from the surrounding. And when you look on top of the wall, you will find that there is a difference. The vegetation, because of the starvation of moisture, that is because of low moisture on top of walls, and maybe less nutrition. The vegetation tends to be a bit stunted when compared to the vegetation in the surrounding. And because of the variations in their reactants to the light that is being emitted to them, we find that they reflect differently. They reflect that light or they react to it differently. And that those variations those are the ones that we use to capture areas of various activity on the archaeological side. And that will be clearer when uh, the case studies are being discussed. And with this, I end my presentation.